Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. And the only thing I remember is I, I took a shot. And I go, and he overhooked me. You know, he put like a wizard on. And I go, and I, I felt the strength of my arm around his waist. I was like, oh, he's small. <laughs> and I, I went right over his head. I locked up. It's called the Noki Finoki. And in 54 seconds, I pinned him. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. You're listening to Wrestling Changed My Life. This is your host, Ryan Warner. I'm on my last day of vacation, and I forgot my microphone. So I'm recording the intros on my iPhone mic, so forgive the audio quality. But let's get to it. My guest is New York legend Nick Gallo. He was the 1977 NCAA champ. He was also the OW that year. He then went on to work for ASICS and was instrumental in signing Dan Gable and creating the Dan Gable shoes. So a lot of us have been influenced by this guy more than we might know or think. I hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week is Danny Olsta. That's Spike1385 on Twitter, holding down Manhattan, Illinois. Thank you for tuning in, Danny. That's it, folks. Let's give it up for Nick Gallo. You know, I know you won the Nationals in 77, so 1967, you probably were 10 or 11 years old in middle school. So take us back in time, Mr. Gallo. What was what was it like for you growing up on Long Island in the 60s? Yeah, well, you know, in my case, you know, back then, a lot of, uh, you know, immigrants, of course, came into New York City. My grandparents were one of them, and my parents were grown up in Brooklyn and in uh, Queens a little bit. And, uh, and you know, those were those were the days where they were living in apartments and just uh, working hard and trying to put food on the table, you know, which was a depression and everything else. What did but, your uh, parents do and your grandparents do for work? My, my grandfather actually ended up being a uh, an artist and, and a uh, hair cutter. He had his own hair, hair, hair barber shop back then. They called them barber shops. And they had the squirrely little red and white and blue, you know, little things yep. that are in front of the. That's what I remember. And uh, and my grandma, I don't know if she ever worked that much. She probably did to make ends meet, but probably sweater shops and things like that, or factories, you know. So that, that's a, that's how they survived. My grandfather wanted to move to New Jersey. My grandmother didn't want to leave Long Island. The story I remember. And my parents, you know, had me in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn, and in, in, uh a two bedroom apartment. And, uh, <clears throat> and then they went out to this town called Deer Park out further east on Long Island. Long Island is about a hundred miles long. So Brooklyn is, you know, 10 minutes out of Manhattan and New York city. But Deer Park was about 35, 40 minutes outside of it. So it was a real, you know, them back then Long Island was kind of the sticks, you know, the forest they called it. And, and you're out in the woods somewhere. But, um, it didn't take long. I live 60 miles outside of New York City now, and and when I moved to where I am now, it was the sticks, and uh, now it's not anymore because the <laughs> population keeps growing out. You know, I'm only 15 minutes from the Hamptons, which you might have heard about, where all the uh, the rich people and the actors and everybody that has money they buy homes out on the beaches. You know, because Long Island has two uh, forks at the end of it, South Fork and the North Fork, and like two fingers sticking out into the ocean, you know, and, and uh, some beautiful homes, beautiful beach homes, you know, in beautiful area, very expensive homes. 
getting built out there. And I'm kind of like towards that that part of Long Island. And so back... Hofstra is... Go ahead. Hofstra is pretty... Hofstra is only about 20 miles outside of New York City. So okay. That's where I went to school. And that's where you wrestled at. Now, when did you first get introduced to the sport? How old were you? Um, I was probably like five years old. I used to... In my case, I was telling you that, you know, with my family moving out, my, my mom and my dad are married to sister and brothers, if you, if you could figure that out. Mm-hmm. My father's sister married my mother's brother, and <clears throat> my mother was, of course, married to my dad. So, and we, we, we were Italian descent. Everybody, family was huge, you know, and they went out and they bought three homes or four homes in a row where all the backyards connected. So I grew up with you know, 12 cousins, you know, they were like my best friends. So we all, and we had the backyards would connect and we would have Sunday mornings. We'd all have breakfast together on, you know, a couple of picnic tables and being out there with the fireplace. And so it was, it was just a great, you can't, you can't, you know, repeat that. So the way I grew up with my cousins and with my friends, you know, there were the other people in the neighborhood, of course, that we hung around with. But, uh, you know, I was always a little squiggly kid and, Everybody always wanted to pick on me, but since probably being five or six years old, I found I had this unique ability to always end up on top, no matter how how they tried to take me down. Big kids, little kids, you know, every everybody, two kids at one time, you know. And I guess I was I, I was like a natural wrestler from a very early age, and, you know. But nobody in my family <clears throat> ever did it. My parents, you know, they weren't my uncles, my aunts, you know, nobody that was really athletic. And, uh, you know, I had a friend tell me, you know, about when I was in eighth grade, he said, you should go out for the wrestling team. I go, why should I do that? He goes, well, you're too small for basketball. So I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Because I didn't even know there was sports when I was in school. And, How do you mean? And, you like, know, did, did, were sports not on TV at that time? Or did you guys not have, like, a house yeah, on TV yet? Yeah, we oh, we used to play stickball. We did everything. We did play football on the street. We did... I love sports, you know, mm-hmm. but I didn't know that school, I didn't know the schools offered it. And one day I'm sitting in class and there was this other kid about my size, maybe a little bit bigger. He, 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 they had a wrestling match and <clears throat> he won his match and he announced it on the loudspeaker in the morning when he used to, he used to do a pre- pledge of allegiance, he'd stand up and then the principal used to say some things over the loudspeaker and then a girl would get on and, and announce, you know, the results of some of the sports and, 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 and wow, the girls really like wow, Ronnie, Ronnie Craddock. You know, they they mentioned his name. Who was it, Ronnie? Like who? That. His name is Ronnie Craddock. <clears throat> Ronnie Craddock getting and, uh, the getting the yeah. win in the eighth grade circuits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you get your name announced on a loudspeaker, and I, I thought that was so cool. So, you know, I went to my parents and I told them, and and then I tried to sign up for the team, and you had to take a physical, and I failed the physical because I. You know, I had asthma really bad. They said, you can't play. You can't. <clears throat> and I went home. I was so pissed off. I was so mad. And my dad was wrong. I didn't want to tell him, but I, I ended up telling him. And, I'm, you know, he says, Nick, he tells my mother, he goes, this kid's running around like, I used to jump off the roof of our two-story house. I swear to God, I was crazy. I was really a crazy kid that I defied all these different things all the time. And um, my mom used to scream all the way down. I jump off the roof and hit a roll and be fine, you know, and, <clears throat> but that, and, and then, uh, you know, I'm running around the neighborhood and my father, like, there's nothing wrong with this kid. So he went down to the school and they said, Mr. Gallo, no problem. You have to sign this waiver. You know, if anything happens to him, we're not liable. So, and thank God my dad didn't. Thank God my dad had the guts to do that because they tried to scare him, you know, and, and I think that's all well, saved my life or increased my life anyhow, you know, and, and uh, the reason why my heart, <laughs> is so powerful and and maybe making it through my 20s like the doctor said you had a you know you had a, you, you 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 passed two one in one million ch- chances he said one was you live through your 20s he said and two was that you um had nothing wrong with your heart when you're 53 years old it's, it's like an 18 year old heart so i so i said you think and then they would tell me his name is Dr. Robinson, and he he would come into the into my room every day after my open heart surgery, and talk to me, you know, and ask me questions. And he was a distance runner, the surgeon. So uh, 
The next day, the nurse comes in. She goes, you got to tell me what's going on. And I said, what are you talking about? So she goes, Dr. Robinson, he, he comes in here every day and speaks to you for like 15 minutes. He closes the door. What are you guys talking about? I said, well, and I stopped. She didn't even say, she goes, you got to understand something. Dr. Robinson doesn't talk to anybody. He barely even talks to us. He's one of these guys that does. How, how, why does he stay in your room? And I said, I said, he's asking me questions about what I did in my lifetime, you know, and he wanted to know, you know, and, and that's when he told me you had, you know, you, you had beat these wrists. So I attributed to wrestling. I mean, I attributed to working out hard. I attributed to, you know, living a clean, cleaner life. You know, I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. All those things might've been factors. So, uh, that's what he, uh, you know, that, that's one of the stories that I have about wrestling. I tell kids, I said, you know, I, I, I really pretty much saved my own life in doing not just wrestling, but athletics and training and all that type of stuff. It's good for you. It's good for your body. And um, it definitely helped me. So, And thank God and your dad you. went to the uh, to the school and got that straightened out. I mean, it sounds like before you yeah. move on to high school and college, it just sounds like your childhood was like a dream childhood. Kids running around all the time, always playing outside. Yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah, four-course dinners on Sunday. You know, the Italians, how they eat. And the hardest part was when I did wrestle and I had to cut weight. That was the worst nightmare that anybody could possibly have. So I had to learn how to stay away from the table and not overeat and do all that other stuff. So that was that was the tough part. And my mom was a great cook and, my grandmother, who lived with us, uh, she was a great cook, and it was so tough, so hard to hold my weight down with smelling the food on Sundays, especially. You know, we'd start eating at it at about two o'clock and we're at eight o'clock at night with everybody's coming <laughs> home. So. I love that Six your grandmother hours. lived with you too. Like that's total immigrant yeah. style. Yeah, yeah, they were they were great, and my my grandparents were great too. You know, because they were in the city, and we have some great beaches out here, and. And I used to, I, I wrote my grandmother a letter before she died, how, how uh, important it was for us grandchildren to be waiting, you know, in the street, looking for their car coming down the street because they came out from Queens. They used to, uh, my, my other set of grandparents used to live in Queens, but my grandfather closed his shop on Wednesdays. And, and during the summer months, he used to come on Wednesdays, take us all over the beach. We, you know, nine of us piled in the back seat. Back then, there was no such thing as seatbelts, so... Man, it was probably this big Chevy and power, you know, and he, he'd drive us all to the beach. we spend the day at the beach, and, you know, till almost where it was dark. It was, and the ocean's rough, too, so we learned, all learned how to swim in the ocean, you know, and catch the waves and go under the breakers and not get sucked out, you know, with the toilet bowl, you know, uh, current that goes out. So it was real knowledgeable stuff that we learned at an early age, you know, so we could, I could swim. I, I have to. I have withdrawal symptoms if I don't see an ocean or I don't swim in the ocean, um, you know, within a certain amount of time. So you guys were just playing all freaking day. You're, I mean, how yeah. your, oh, we your grandparents rolled up? That must have been like the – you see that car, you're like, oh. hell yes, we're going to the beach, baby. Yeah, we're going to the beach. Grandma's coming. You know, Grandpa's going to take us to the beach because our, our fathers all worked, you know, and they couldn't do that during the day. <clears throat> so he used to come out with my grandmother and – take us all out to the beach and you know we go clamming some days we go you know fishing other days and you know there's always something to do out, out on the water so it was, it was a lot of fun how different is your childhood than the what kids experience now <laughs> you know parents are working now no one goes outside it's like right totally different right i i tried to uh you know I, i've been fortunate and i you know i tell all my friends and all people that i talk to all the time um you know that i probably have the um, number one dream job in wrestling. I, I really still believe that because I was a college coach. I coached Division One for about five years, you know, and I, 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 I found other, you know, forms of employment when I was younger. You know, I'm a car guy. I used to do car detail, and I still have my very first car. It was a '65 Mustang that looks like a, a Shelby. Uh, I'm gonna stay now. So wow. So I'm 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 a car guy. I had all these different avenues I could have went. When I went when I went, first you know applied to college, I wanted to be a pilot because I love speed. I still love speed. I love to be in a jet. You know, I never have been in a jet, but I, that was one of the childhood dreams I had. I wanted to fly. So I lost that ambition. You know, after I went to Hofstra because I did apply to 
Air Force, I didn't choose to go. I applied to Kings Point, I didn't choose to go. I applied to Navy, I didn't choose to go. Hospital was the only one that gave me uh, money to go to school, you know, and that <clears throat> my father couldn't afford it, you know, so um, I had to get something. So they gave me a small scholarship, which really wasn't, the college wasn't as expensive as it is now. So it was enough to just get me, so I could commute back and forth to hospital. It was about a 25 minute ride. Oh, you commuted? <clears throat> I commuted, yes. Wow. Right? And then when I and later on in later on in the uh, in my junior and senior, year, I started staying the winter because sometimes we had bad rainstorms and snowstorms and ice storms. So I told my parents, I go, listen, I'll save the money and I'll stay. I'll stay in the dorms for the winter recess. Wrestling's only, you know, one month into the spring recess, so it's not a big deal, you know, staying late and going. So, <clears throat> so for the spring, I would commute, and the winter, I would. Stay in, a, stay in a room. And, you know, I found another way that because I lived there, I was privy to, uh, you know, a lot of rooms that guys wouldn't show up or that they buy themselves in a room. And then I would just say, I'll stay with you. I'll give you so much a night. You know, it's not a big deal. So I always had a room to stay in if I wanted to stay overnight. So that worked out pretty good. Different, <laughs> different times back then, man. It's just, it's cool to yeah. hear about it. Now, before you got to college, you placed in the New York States. And I wanted to ask you about an individual. I I came across him in my research. I heard he was just lights out in high school. His name was Jim Earl. You ever you know that name? Jimmy Earl. I sure do. How good was he? Jimmy was very good because his dad his dad was part of there's a guy named Sprig Gardner that started kind of wrestling here in in the New York area on Long Island. He um he was you know, they, they 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 give credit to to the Martin family for the Granby role and everything else down in uh, Virginia, but they pretty much learned a lot from Sprig Gardner. And Sprig Gardner, you know, he had this uh, team out in Metham, you know, that were killers. They were in Long Island champs forever. They, you know, Pascal Perry used to wrestle there. You know, all these guys that are the guy that offic- you know, you know who Pascal Perry is. He officiated Dan and uh, Larry Owens' okay. match in the Nationals. But uh, these these are names like Hunt, Steve Hunt. You might remember mm-hmm. his dad. Those guys really, really were the uh, what do you call it? Pioneer. The pioneers, right, of of wrestling on Long Island, and and then you know you work your way down to Lou Gianni and Al Bevilacqua and, and and names like that start popping up. But but Jim Earl, his dad was the coach of his high school. He was a they were all mean dudes back then. This guy named Jack Stambrough. You know they, they were guys that defied all the rules. I mean, they, they pretty much did what they wanted. I don't know. If, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. They wanted, <laughs> I don't want to go any further than that, but you know, they could lock you in a, in a sauna and not get in trouble or they could, you know, beat the crap out of you and not get in trouble, you know? So these guys were our mentors and our fathers and a guy named Joe Campo at Brentwood, you know, he, he was uh, like Pete Galea's and Bobby Antonacci's and Carl Adams coach, you know, and th- these guys were like the guys that I, you know, really looked up to. My coaches were good, but they weren't in that category. You know, and my high school coaches, they were great guys. And so I lived in Deer Park. Brentwood was like, you know, two miles away from, you know, the Deer Park border. And and I always told my parents, "Can we move to Brentwood? Can we? Move? I want to wrestle for Brentwood. Can we move?" <laughs> and uh, you know, they would, of course they never moved because we were in this tight uh, little yeah little little Italy, you can call it. And um. And I really didn't want to move, but I wanted to wrestle for, for those guys. And they became my friends. You know, what I did is I started seeing them down at the beach, you know, and I would I would be like a little tag along, you know, and I, I didn't care. I didn't care. I just wanted to be their friends. And you know what? They took me in on their, under their wings, both Pete and Bobby and <laughs> Pete's brother, and and it made me feel like I belonged with them, you know, and that made me better as a wrestler. I, I really think that that's a little secret that I had throughout my career is that if I hang around with the guys and I feel like them, I'm going to wrestle like them, you know, and, and, and it really did work. I did that, you know, and, and people say, Oh, how did you, uh, you know, how'd you win the nationals going to Hofstra? And, you know, my answer is always, Hey, I didn't win the nationals going to Hofstra. I, I, I don't know anybody that could do it just on one campus. You know what I mean? So, I started going, you know, my, my junior year, I tried out for the Olympic team and I made one of the alternates. So I hung around with the guys, <clears throat> went up to Montreal 
and hung around with Gable, hung around with Desik, hung around with the Peterson brothers, you know, watched those guys train, and they took me under their wing. I was actually babysitting for Gene Davis and and uh, some of these the Peterson brothers. You know, they had, they had kids already. And uh, Was so that a big eye-opening like experience, I, seeing those guys train? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll train with them. I mean, I was I was exhausted. I, you know, when I started team with, I, I used to think I was the hardest worker in the whole world because I'm in this little world at Hofstra, you know, and these guys couldn't keep up with me. And, you know, I so said, there's nobody who trains as hard as me. And then I then I made this team and I hung out with them and I'm like, oh, oh my God. I said, I this is a whole different level that I've ever, because we would go, you know, we would go two, three, four days and then, you know, I would be like dragging my, my, my ass over to dinner, you know, and the, and the weight room was kind of, you know, in one of these buildings that I had to walk past. And I would look in the window and I'm like, I can't believe what I'm saying here. This is like totally insane. I said, the two Peterson brothers are weightlifting right before dinner. So I pulled my hand. I go, you guys are crazy. They go, yeah, we are. Why don't you come and join us? And it was almost like they said it like I didn't have a choice. So I go, Okay. And I went in and I started weightlifting. I go, this is insane. I said that my body, I, I couldn't even walk right to to dinner and I'm working out again. <laughs> but you know what? I did it. And I would meet him there every, every other night. And, and I was able to do it. And I was like, God, it's amazing what your body could withstand. So it really did open my eyes to a lot of, a lot of different things. And then everybody, I came back to school in my senior year. I, I had a bad junior year, junior year. <clears throat> I'm not going to make any excuses, but I, I think the coach just kind of overused me. You know, he kept on making me cut down to a weight class that I shouldn't have been at. And um, by the end of the season, I was the body was mangled. You know, I was taped from my knee to my neck. You know, and it diff, just just different injuries and holding my weight down for so many months wasn't wasn't healthy. And, that's the old school days I, of weight cutting. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> the next in my senior year, I sat down with him before the season started, and I said, "Listen." I know you have a team to win. I understand that. I want to be a team player, blah, blah, blah. But this year is about me, and I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I'll tell you when I'll wrestle at what weight. And I could beat everybody in the team up to heavyweight, so he couldn't say anything. You know, so uh, so he uh, he let me do what I wanted to do my senior year, and, and the results were what they were. You know, he uh, he uh, was good. You know, he was good. He was a good listener, and, and he wasn't, you know, somebody, if I mentioned his name, he wouldn't even – know who he was. His name was Bob Getchell and uh, he was a great administrator. He was the athletic director at the same time as being the wrestling coach. So, wow. you know, here's a, for instance, I win the, I win the qualifier and I have one other guy in the team that qualified with me. He's a 190 pounder and he was Romanian and he defected from Romania and we had a Russian defect from uh, uh, Russia and we had these two guys on the team that was the greatest experience of our lives because we learned that you know, how lucky we are, pretty much. Some of the stories that they told us. So, anyhow, the 190 pounder. Oh, yeah, I still stay in touch with him to this day. That, you know, Share a couple a of great them. guy. Yeah, one was Serene Baliano. He was a he was a Romanian. And the other one's name was Delic Ziegelbaum. He was from Moscow, and he was a Russian, you know. And uh, some of the stuff that we learned from these two guys, I tell you, it really made us humble, you know. And uh, and they're going to be two great guys. I talked to them today. It's another thing that wrestling does is that uh, it just it just makes lifetime you know friendships and stuff. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But right now, you know, with Serene, he, I had nobody to work out with, so I made a phone call to this guy Paul Gillespie, who was a fourth in in, in NCAA's uh, year before. He wrestled for Westchester State College, Pennsylvania, and. Uh, he was my training partner. He was a beast. He was a 142 pounder. I'm a 126 pounder, so you know the size difference was pretty huge. But I loved getting beat up by him in the beginning, and then I found myself, hey, you know what? I'm not going even with him, but I'm giving him a tough time. You know, and he's my best tra- training partner. So I called him up, and uh, I said, Paul, I haven't wrestled. No one here is coming. You know, I'm only two qualifiers here. You know. Serene, I could wrestle for a while, but he gets tired, and you know, I start beating him up, and he's not really good for me, you know. He's a 190-pounder guy; he's a beast, but he couldn't, he didn't have the cardiovascular that, that I had. So <laughs> he goes, "I'll be down, I'll be down." So I was like, "Oh, this is great! They'll show up and me up. I'll be ready to go." 
in uh, Oklahoma, you know, where it was in Norman, Oklahoma, for the Nationals were that year. And, <clears throat> and Paul was always notorious for warm ups. All right, let's warm up. Let's take shots. You didn't know, want to waste any time. It's like, okay, let's get going. I said, we just took one shot each. <laughs> that was his warm up. <laughs> he goes, you're ready. So, you know, he used to slap me on the back of the head with his left arm, and then he would kick your right foot out. So I, I knew it. I was like Pavlov dog. I knew as soon as he hit me on my head, I would lift my foot up, and his foot would slide right underneath mine. And, and then he would, right after he did that, if he missed the foot sweep, he would shoot a high crotch. So I was ready for that. And I kind of threw my hip in a little bit, you know, to block him. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, you know, I, I'll say it. You don't have to say it in an interview, but a few choice words came out of his mouth, and he's like spitting. And he's spitting his teeth out. I knocked four of his teeth out with my hip. Bone. So I, I didn't know it. I didn't even feel it. So he's spitting blood all over the mat. He had to go to the hospital. And I'm thinking to myself, God, I just freaking knocked all his teeth out. And, and he's going on. But I'm looking at him walk out the door. I go, that's my only workout part. <laughs> what am I going to do for two weeks? Because my coach, who was an athletic director, he 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 had to go to an athletic director's meeting the week before the national. So I wasn't going to see him until we got on the on the plane. You know, and and I couldn't get in touch with him. And I'm trying to tell him nobody on the team is showing up to practice. I don't have any workouts. I've been on the stationary bike. I'm running my ass off. I'm in the weight room, but I got to wrestle. I got to be able to get my timing down. And um, and another guy named Dave Fox, and I called him that same night. I said I got to get a workout partner. So he was he was another he was another guy, and uh, and um. You know, he wrestled for New York Athletic Club, and he was really tough. You know, he was like a you know he's a top six guy in the country at 136 and a half. And I go, I call him up, and I go, Dave, this is Nick. I go, listen, I'm going to nationals in two days. I haven't wrestled. I really need you to help me out and show up and and uh, you know give me a workout. And he he got quiet. He wouldn't say anything for a few seconds. And I'm like, are you okay? I, I, could you do that? And he goes, he goes, I'll do it. He goes. But if you knock my fucking teeth out, I'll fucking... I didn't know how he even knew about what happened. It was only a few hours ago, you know? How does he know that that... You know, he, he's... Because, you know, Dave was... He was very popular with the F word. And I'm like, listen, I, I promise I won't do it. I don't even know what I did. So he came down. I worked out with him. And, and I guess it was enough. You know, I didn't wrestle... You know, I, I didn't feel 100%, you know, but I definitely felt 80 or 90%. It was probably so. a... A blessing in disguise because back then guys were notorious for overtraining, and so right you right. I mean you were you're still training hard, but like really your body had a good week and a half to kind of rest up, and then you went right, to nationals. Right. Um, yeah, no, I, it was great that you know because I knew that once I got on the plane, you know everybody said what's the difference of wrestling at a small school at Hofstra or wrestling at Iowa? I go this is the difference. I could tell you this very easy, and you'll understand. I said, I'm walking around campus and I'm a little late for class or, or I'm walking around campus and people are looking at me. I go, and nobody knows who I am. And the teachers don't care who I am either. They they, they could care less if I wrestle. Oh, you missed class yesterday. I go, yeah, it was a head match, you know, or Coast Guard or whatever. And and um, I go to Iowa City probably to this day sometimes. And I'm walking around Iowa City and I hear people whispering, that's Nick Gallo. I'm like, Oh my God! People in the city know who I am. I said I could walk around Hofstra campus all day long, and nobody even knows who I was, you know. And I said, imagine the motivation difference that you're walking around and people are noticing you, and you feel like, all right, I'm kicking my ass every day for a purpose, you know. And but at Hofstra, you know, it's it's a little bit different. They, but you don't get that kind of motivation. I, and I always told people that's what you have to do. You have to really, you have to really focus on one thing that it, this is important. It's important to a lot more people that are here in New York or you know or throughout the country or whatever. And if you can keep that focus, I used to tell my kids on my team, it's important. It's going to be important to you. It's going to be important to them. It's a lot more important than you think. You know that your everyday life. I said, and if you do well, you know you're going to benefit from it. And and but it's hard. It's hard to um, keep that when you're feeling bad or you're feeling like, what am I doing this for? You you hurt or you depressed or whatever you might be it's hard to get up out of that bed or get out of that room and you know go and bust your ass in wrestling practice because it doesn't seem like anybody else cares that much so why should you 
And uh, and I, but once I got on that plane and once I set foot on the ground and I started seeing wrestling people and people who I knew and you know I got to Oklahoma and I was like a whole different person. I really was. I, I, I felt like full of adrenaline. I was ready to go. This is it. You know, it's game time. Blah blah blah. And and that's how I was able to pick it up. And you it, won. it wasn't easy. I mean, to your point, the end of a wrestling season, and if it's weather like we're dealing with today, it's jury out, you're cutting weight, right. it can be a little depressing at times, you know, and it's, sure, it's a long sure. season. Right, but you, but you walk out your door in, in Iowa, and then there's somebody, you go you go to the, uh, you know, you go to the local bagel store or whatever, and and, uh, and and five people say hello to you, and they know who you are because of your wrestling, that, it helps, mm-hmm. it definitely does help. So... So how many like is that the same Jimmy Martin who went to Penn State? I mean, yeah, the dad, the dad. Um, no, that's not the same Martin. The Penn State Martin isn't the same Martin. No, no, there was a. There okay, was, it's not. Yeah, okay. yeah, and Mr. Martin, he was, he was like I said, they, they, they were real big on the Granby role, and you know, and and I, you know, for me and being in Oklahoma, you know, I, I, I kind of walked through all the matches before Billy. You know, I was doing pretty good. I felt pretty good. I scored. My, my my philosophy was because a few times in my career I left I left a little bit up to the wrestling official to make a decision on a match. Instead of that, I said my my game plan was to score as many points as I could to take the wrestling official out of the match. And I did that in the first you know actually I did it throughout the whole tournament to tell you the truth because nobody I didn't have a close match really. So you know with Billy. You know, I, I thought for sure I had really close matches with Jimmy Carr. Both times I wrestled with him. I mean, I went out there and he came out to the, um, it was called the Nassau Coliseum. It's right outside Hofstra's campus. It's a coliseum there that some professional teams play sports at. Island is, uh, you know, and then the, New, the, the Brooklyn Nets used to be there. <clears throat> Who they are now used to be the New York Nets. But um, I, I, I was wrestling my, quarterfinal match. I think it was a Dane Ives from Missouri. And I won I won pretty decisively there. I I, I, I scored twenty something points and I, I you know I know that I it was it was a brawl though. The kid was tough. I give him a lot of credit. <clears throat> he was tough. But I but I scored a, a million points and I said I gotta do this tomorrow because you know I when I was wrestling him I was just finishing up and I look over at uh the mat that uh Billy and uh Jimmy Carr wrestling on, and Jimmy was beating him. But in the third period, he got Jimmy got a court in that damn gravity roll. He really did, and and the, it was so deafening the sound of the the sound of the building because it was in Oklahoma and there was a lot of Oklahoma State, you know, fans there. It was so loud, and I said, if I give him any chances of those people getting excited and giving them momentum, I'm gonna have myself, you know, I'm gonna have my hands full. When I went out and wrestled Billy, I never wrestled him before. Heard about him. I know he was second, I think a year or two before. Um, and uh, I said, you know, never had trouble with gravity guys before, you know. And I said, I'm going to stick to my game plan. You know, I'm a, I'm a good leg rider. I could I could ride anybody with legs, and I'm going to make sure I get that in. But I'm going to make sure I control the match from the very beginning. So I went right out. I scored right away. He started going pretty hard. The, the strands were. If you almost got a takedown, it would get loud like that that noise again. And then pretty much I continued to beat beat him up pretty badly. I think I won 50. You smoked him. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but I had legs. Was Jimmy Carr losing? Was Jimmy Carr losing a big upset because he was a phenom? Yeah, he was. He was incredible. When I wrestled him in the Coliseum, like I said, the first first ten seconds of the match, you know, he went right up the body with me, and I didn't care. I said I can go up the body too, and boom, I was on my back for five. I was like, oh. Crap! I fucking got a five point. <laughs> so I came back and I beat him like nine to seven. It was it was a crazy match, you know, because he was just trying to, you know, hold on. And I, I, if he probably came after me, he would have did better. But ended up beating him there, you know. And <clears throat> and then I wrestled him in freestyle a bunch of times. And I've always beat him there. But they were they were bond burners. They were, you know, I had to go really yeah. hard. And you know, in my back pocket, I always knew that he got tired. You know, that was Jimmy's downfall. You know, he. uh it's hard for him to go, especially a nine-minute match, you know. So I just would keep pushing him. Nine-minute match. Yeah, yeah. Woo! They were three, three, oh. three, 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 three. Little minute rest in between. God. 
So in the finals, you have Moreland from Iowa. Yeah. And so Gable has to be a mentor and an idol at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a friend. Maybe, he maybe, he's like a family friend. He, he was really. a friend already? Yeah. At that point, he was? Yeah, because with the Olympic, you know, I spent about six, seven weeks with him and his family. And 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 he really liked me a lot. And and what I did when I, well, well you know, he liked me a lot. I I. I I really, you know, developed a relationship with him because he was the Olympic coach in 76. He liked me a lot. You know, I had really good matches with Jim Humphrey and those guys, and they knew I was young. And they said, you you know, maybe you could be part of our future. You're part of our future team. They start grooming you a little bit and making you feel like you're part of the whole family. And and uh, it was tough. It was tough on me because Kathy Gable even came to me. It was such a, it was such a tight race between Iowa State and, and Iowa that year. You know, Kathy, his wife is, you know, Dan would never say something like this, but she was like, you know, if you beat our guy, we, we're probably not going to win the team title. And I looked at her, and in my mind, I didn't say anything, but I, I said, well, you know, I don't really give a crap about your team title. <laughs> I got, I got to win, you know, and 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 it's for me, and uh, you know, I, I can't be worried about the University of Iowa winning. A, you know, Gabriel said that if they won that year, he would have had his ten in a row, you know, and and. Uh, <laughs> So, it's almost like uh, yeah, it's I'm almost like, like a, fuck the team title. Yeah, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So you know, what do you say? But you know, there was there was also the notion that if I wanted to wrestle anybody in the finals, I think if I take, it would have been Keith because I wrestled him before, and I you know I knew a little bit of what he did, but he it scared me because Keith and I wrestled the same night that I wrestled Jimmy Carr in the Coliseum, and I went out there and, and I was wrestling, I wrestled in a tournament in Connecticut a couple of days before we were right to this dual meet, you know, uh, in, in New York. And, uh, you know, I won the 34 pound weight class. I won outstanding wrestling the tournament up at Coast Guard Academy. And, um, and I'm going into this tournament and, and the only thing I remember is I, I took a shot I go, and he overhooked me, you know, he put like a wizard on. And I go, and I, I felt the strength of my arm around his waist. I was like, oh, he's small. <laughs> And I, I went right over his head. I locked up. It's called an Oki Finoki. And in 54 seconds, I pinned him. So that was that was the first time I wrestled him. And, and Gable was pissed because, you know, they beat us like 39 to 6. That was the, I was the only one that won. And I, I pinned him. Mm-hmm. So, so when I had to wrestle Keith again, I felt like, okay, I got a pretty good chance now. You know, I, I'm, I just got to, you know, keep the game plan, score your points, wear them down. You know, don't let the crowd get into it because there's a lot of Iowa people there. I have three people from Hofstra, you know, screaming for me. And, and Did uh, your folks come? No, no. My parents, there's a story to that, too. My mom came to my first match when I uh, was in middle school. She was so worried about me wrestling. She didn't like me fighting, blah, blah, blah. She came, and I wrestled this kid. I was, was going for my eighth win because I was 7-0 and 0 as, a, as my first year of wrestling. And... and he goes, I go out there, and, and I ended up pinning the kid. And I look over at her, and she's crying. She's, like, tugging on my father. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to do this. I don't like this. This is fighting. And she's crying, and I'm like, but I won. You know, I won. <laughs> she, she, she didn't care. She she didn't like her son fighting. So my parents stayed home, and, you know, I called my mom the next morning when I won the national. I said, hey, mom, dad, you know what, I... Well, right after I won the national, I called them that night and I said, uh, I won. So they go, and they didn't know what NCAA meant. They didn't really, you know, know college what sports did. wasn't near as big a market as it is now, right? Was it? Right. Well, it was. It was big. You know, like I said, to people that that we that know, knew it. you know, yeah, it was huge. You it know, was it was huge. huge. But yeah. to, to regular people, you know, my dad. The first time I I told him I was, you know, was wrestling, he thought I meant. Uh, you know, wrestling on the grass. So he goes, you better not get your knees green, you know, from the grass. You wrestle on the grass. Because I used to come home, like, filthy, you know. So, yeah. so like, no, Dad, we wrestle on mats. You know, it's really, it's, there's mats, and you don't get your knees green. <laughs> so they had no no clue. And, and my mom really never came to another match after that one. My dad used to come. My dad started coming, you know, to Hofstra. He used to start enjoying it. He and my, my dad was a swimmer. And a little bit of a marksman, you know, with, with his guns and everything else. He always saw wrestling as, you know, kind of weird in the beginning. And uh, and then later on, he started saying, I see what you do. When I got that college scholarship, it wasn't much. It really wasn't. But when I got that college scholarship, like he goes, he looked at me and he says, now I understand why you were doing this. I said, 
yeah, I want to go to college, you know, and I, I would, most of my cousins, you know, didn't go, you know, I, I was, I was the first out of the, the 12 that, um, that graduated of college, you know, so it was, uh, it was pretty cool, you know, and, and then, and then later on the younger cousins started doing the same thing. So it was kind of, I, I took the lead and they followed. So, but that's how, you know, that's how my parents were. Well, they weren't, they weren't, uh Oh, did I lose you again? No, 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 not at all. I was going to say that's all because of wrestling. Right. How did you, how did you transition into? So did you design the Gable shoe, or how did you hook up Asics well, and Gable? What's yeah, that whole story? Yeah, right. What, what what happened was <clears throat> after I did what I did, I did something pretty special, and I knew it. I'm, I'm I mean, I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. only 21. I didn't. I never redshirted. I just barely turned, you know, 21 because I was. A, I I ended up skipping kindergarten for some reason, which is. You know, a quick story into that. My dad had to go to Oklahoma for. Uh, he was a. He was a. Uh, he wasn't a radar. He was a radar technician for the for Kennedy Airport. So he wasn't the uh, the guy that put the planes up. there. he was in charge of all the equipment. Had to be working. So it was pretty stressful. And he had to go to school in Oklahoma for about six to eight months. So he he, he wrapped us all up in this old '57 Chevy, and we drove down to Oklahoma like in the beginning of of the school year. <laughs> And then we came back like in March, you know, and so actually I went and saw the home that I lived in, you know, after I won the national title because it was right down the road. And I wanted to see what it looked like, you know, because I, I, mm-hmm. I, I was only, I was only four or five years old, but the story is in New York, they have a cutoff date of December 31st. If you're not five by December 31st, you have to wait till the next year to go to um, kindergarten. So, and in every other state, pretty much in Oklahoma, it was at least September 1st is the cutoff date. So if you're not five by September 1st, then you don't get to go to kindergarten. And I'm a November 21st birthday. So I'm a late birthday. I'm a slow mature. I didn't have hair under my arms when I graduated high school. You know? <laughs> so, you know, all those things took effect. And then when I became back from Oklahoma, my mom went to register me at the kindergarten. They said, no. He can't go to kindergarten. He's going to be six by December thirty first. So they skipped me to first grade. I was, I was like, so not only being young and immature and slow, you know, kind of a slow uh, grower. You know, I went to college at seventeen. I graduated at twenty one. You know, and and uh, and uh, yeah, I was I was barely twenty probably when I when they entered the blaze. So, so but but uh, yeah, I didn't so. When I when I did what I did, I had a few job offers. I got thrown out to Colorado for assistant coaching job at, in Boulder, and then I I got another offer. Uh, uh, what was it in uh, Pennsylvania? At a, at a school, I had a, yeah, I had Lehigh. A lot of Lehigh people wanted me as an assistant coach. So probably anywhere in the country I could have went, but they knew I I didn't really want to leave New York. So I got a letter in the mail. From uh, Bill Farrell. Uh, do you know who Bill Farrell is? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, he's so, the one who taped Gable in the Olympics. Right, he's the Olympic coach in 1972. So he wrote me a letter, and because these offers were pretty good, and people were talking, hey, Nick might go to Colorado to coach, but he saw it as losing me as a New York Athletic Club wrestler. So, so he wrote me a a note, just said, "Don't leave New York. See me, DF." You know, Bill. So I was like, really? So a lot of the guys that worked for Bill back then had to work on trucks and deliver universal gyms, which was, uh, you know, which was the uh, the form of weightlifting equipment back in those days. And it was going crazy. And Bill made millions off of it. He really did well in the fitness craze. You know, it was a fitness craze in the late 70s into the 80s. And Bill made some really good money. And he, and, and he brought us in. I made my wrestling coach come with me because he knew him as a friend, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and he said, hey, listen, Nick doesn't want to come here and, you know, work on trucks and do be a truck deliverer and carry things around. He wants to come here. He wants to be able to train. He wants to try to make the AD Olympic team, blah, blah, blah. You know, and if you don't have an administrative position, he's not interested. So they go, no, no, no. He, you know, Bill said, no, no, no. We, we, wanted, we wanted to run our wrestling division. So I said, what? Well, pretty good and Sonny Greenhouse was there already so I pretty much weren't working under a guy named Sonny Greenhouse and um, he was my mentor for, 
for about a year and a half until he left the business. And then they put me in, in, in charge. And then I, and, uh, my partner, Neil Duncan, came along uh, about six months later. So, <clears throat> so, so I've been running that wrestling division. And, you know, the first thing that I, I you know, I, I thought about it. I, I go, why don't we have Dan Gable under a contract? And Bill would look at me. And, and believe it or not, Dan wasn't a great communicator. I, I, you probably heard that about him when he was younger, sure. you know, and his dad was a little rough around the edges. If you know what I mean? His dad was, yeah. Mac was tough. He's a tough guy. And, and I happened to be, you know, go to the Midlands one year and I spent time with the Gables. I went to the house, blah, 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 you know, with them. Well, I went to a, a party after the Midlands and Christmas, whatever. And he was there. Mac was there. Mrs. Gable was there. <clears throat> and he just, he was drinking a little bit and he came over. He goes, you're a gal. I go, yeah, and I kind of like, okay, oh, 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 here we go. You know, so, so he goes, uh, you, you, you work with Bill Fowl, right? So he, I go, yeah, yeah, I'm working with Bill. And he goes, you know, I don't usually like people from New York. He goes, they walk, they walk too fast, they talk too fast, and they, and they screw you too fast. I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I get to say? <laughs> okay, is that how you feel? But he goes, well, you know what? I go, no, what, what? He goes. I like you. And I said, well, thank you. And I said, thank you. He goes, you're real. He goes, uh, I could tell. And I said, well, thanks, Mr. Gable. I really appreciate you saying that, you know. And then I went back to Bill, and I said, you got to sign Gable. And um, he goes, what do you mean? I go, you got to sign Gable. And then I found out that, you know, there's, there's these relationships that go on through people are so different. Like, I'm thinking that Dan loves Gable, and Gable loves, I mean, sorry, Bill loves Gable and Gable loves Bill. It wasn't the case. And and I sat Bill down one time. I said, what is it? What is it about Dan that, that loves you? Said, no, I like Dan. I love Dan. He really, you know, and I brought this whole relationship back together because the, there was a problem. And the problem was that Wayne Wells was Bill Farrell's spoiled best child. Bottom line. Got it. So, you know, Wayne had a law degree. Bill had a, a partial law degree. He always felt like Wayne Wells got screwed. Didn't get the attention that Dan got. You know, and I learned in my my career here that there's nobody that makes that decision. It's it's you have no control over it. You know, guys, because when we when we start naming shoes after guys, and everybody's like, you know, like like even for a while there, we never had a shoe named after a black wrestler, and we were being called mm-hmm. almost being called racist. And I'm like. No, that's not how it works. You see, we don't have the final word on it. It has to mesh. It has to be right. It has to be perfect. It has to fit. You know, having a shoe named after Gable was not a hard decision. You know, he, he knew everybody. He was a legend. He was a myth. He was like nobody really understood him. I didn't even understand him in the beginning. He was kind of strange until he had a beer. He would open up, and and, and, and that's how I got to to know him pretty well. You know, so when what is something like you learned through Gable that people might not know from what they read about him? The, the, the thing I learned about Gable is, you know, and, and I don't I don't usually tell people this either. I think what happened to Dan and his family caused a real serious problem about trust because of Diane. You know, they, they, yeah. they trusted that they could leave her there. They did it. The neighborhood was safe. She was okay. Mr. Gable lost trust, Dan. You lose trust. It's like getting divorced. You know, you, you see a person that gets divorced. They're very weakened. You know, they're very they're very nervous about anything, and they think that everybody that comes over to them, you know, is trying to screw them in some way or whatever. So it's, it it gives you a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. But I think Dan's thing was trust. You know, and and he didn't talk to many people and. He started doing some Gable camps, and I would bring him at that night. I would tell him, I go, listen, I think you did a great job today. However, you got to be more open. You just can't say, do this, do that, do this. you got to tell him why. you got to tell him a story. you got to say, hey, listen, one time I had this guy in his position, and I did this. I said, you got to open up a little bit more. He was so you know, introverted, but he was, it was hard to, you know, and, and, I, and I really believe that, they bobbled it all up, you know, this thing that happened to him in his early, and, and, you know, rightfully so, you know, it you know, it happened to you. I mean, a town was, like Waterloo back right. then, like that had to be earth shattering news. Yes, for sure. 
So I think I think that it's the trust factor. Dan Dan had to watch everything that he did, and when he was when he came to us too, you know, we had to make sure that he felt comfortable, you know, and and uh, this is the way it's going to be because Dan worked with another company before he came back. Instance, not a lot of people know that. Do you remember the company? Mm. It was called Metalist. He okay, had, I was going to say. Tiger, but uh, that is yeah. Asics. No, it was Tiger was us, and we went from Tiger to A6 Tiger to A6. But Dan was with another company called Metalist. They, they didn't have a clue. You know, they, they, what they were doing was crazy. They had a shoe that was okay, but it would fall apart. You know, and I just told Dan, like, well, you got to be with A6. They're the best wrestling shoe in the world. And <clears throat> you're the best wrestler in the world. This has got to work. I got to get Bill and you on the same, you know, same level and. And uh, your dad, <clears throat> and it's just going to work out really good. And, and that's what I had to do. I had to tell Bill. I had to Bill, you know, we need him. I tell you, he's going to help us more than anybody else if we have him on our side. So I, I kind of feel like Bill ended up, you know, pulling it off. But it was because of uh, my uh, interjection that uh, those two got along. And, um, you know, and, and it worked out so great. Did you guys design the Gable shoe, or was that Asics who did that? The, the secret here is that, you know, I know a lot about a wrestling shoe. I could tell you that, but I'm not. I'm not a designer. And my, yeah. I'm a very trustful person. I really do give people that second chance. I really do give them. You know, I open up the door to them. And so with me, you know, I, I saw the shoes that the Japanese were creating, and all we, you know, me, Bill, and Neil, and. I said, listen, let's just give them the ideas. Let's tell them what we think should be here. Maybe you could change that. You could change that. You can make this like that. But we would give them a, a design of a shoe and wait for the sample to come. And we were blown away. It was like 10 times better than we could even imagine because they were the designers and they just needed the ideas. And that's what we were good at. We're, we're professionals in ideas, not designing. You know, sometimes we get some knuckleheads at ASICs that, they're out of college and they think they're a shoe designer already, you know, and it's like, oh, God. I said, just leave it to the right. Japanese. Just leave it to the Japanese. Tell them what you think it should be and you're going to be pleasantly surprised, you know, and that, that's that been the, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much been the focus of all these years. It's just to get them to design the shoe the way it's supposed to be. You're making a shoe that's light, you know, it's got to look good, it's got to last. So here, here there you have two contradictions victory things because uh one has got to be light one's got to be durable so how do you do that right well you should well and you i was gonna say you uh you and mr farrell you were working with the same individual at asics tiger that phil knight worked with that he documented in his book shoe dog right i mean the time because at the beginning Asics Tiger was running shoes and wrestling shoes, right. and Phil Knight kind of took that over, and he had a blue ribbon company at the right. time, and he turned that into to Nike. But um, it's the same person in Japan that you right. guys are dealing with here. Yeah, they, you know, it's it's there's there's uh, manning, management guys, and then there's shoe designers. They're, they're two different animals completely. They're two different departments, but you have to go through the management to get to the designers. So. And the designers uh, have to go to the management to get things approved. So, you know, it's all in, interrelated. And they're tough. Japanese people are tough. But I, I, could, right. t- I could tell you this. I mean, I see ASICs having all kinds of trouble with them now because they got new management. They keep telling me that the Japanese are hard to work with. But I've never had, you know, I'm not sucking up to anybody, but I've never had one problem with one Japanese person that I had to work with. They, they love us. They love us as, as Americans. They love us as who we were and what we've done. To this day, I have my job still because the number one guy in Mason is a really good friend of mine. So otherwise, I think, you know, in, in large corporations, people get hired, rehired, new people. I don't even know who I am anymore. But the people in Japan protect us, you know, so protect me. Right. So, uh, and that's how it works, you know. And, and I keep Dan along because I keep on saying, I go, Dan, when you go, I go. I said, we've been in this for 40, 43 years now together, you know, and um, I fight for him, you know, and he fights for me. And we keep it, we try to keep it uh, going. And, and we have been great friends to wrestling. Asics has been the best friend they've ever had. You know, Nike's been coming in lately, but they turn, they turn their backs on 
wrestling a whole bunch of times in the last 40 years. So we're trying to forget. It's like they were on board with it with Colat in the 90s, and they got off of it. Now they're back on really right, hard. Right, yeah, you got to be careful. There's, there's that trust factor again, you know. And I know Rich Bender and everybody at USA Wrestling was real worried about the changeover. And I said, no, this is good. It's good. Not for me, not for ASICs, it's not good, but it's good for wrestling. And I go, I'm a wrestler too. So, you know, half of me is is happy and half of me is sad, but let's see if they're going to stay behind the sport. Let's see if it's going to help us grow, you know, and see how long they're going to be in the game because they tend to come in and out. And uh, we'll see what happens. But we won't know that, you know, for probably the next four years. They come back and they renew the contract and stay with you as a wrestling and, you know, and, and do things. It's, you know, ASICs is going to be hard for them to beat because they have they have such a foothold of the market, you know, and, and all these dealers and people that sell the shoes, you know, if your mom and dad sold the shoes in a, <clears throat> a little shop down in Illinois there and they bought a hundred pairs right. of shoes. They bought a hundred pairs of shoes and they sold a hundred pairs of shoes to happy campers. Why would they want to change? So if they buy a hundred pair of ASICs and they sell but if they buy 50 Nikes and they only sell 30, they're left with 20, they're not happy. So it's a simple thing like that. So over the years, everybody's been, you know, pretty happy with the performance of, of ASICs. And the fact that it does sell out their inventory is, it means a lot to them. It's money on their, their table. Right. Well, Mr. Gallo, it's been an honor to talk with you, sir. I think yeah. we'll just wind down with, you know, what have you learned from wrestling, or how has wrestling changed your life? Just given your uh, your deep history with the sport. Yeah. Well, now <clears throat> now that I'm sixty, I'm going to be sixty five this year. So I'm getting I'm getting up there in years, and you know, and as you get older, you you start changing a lot of your philosophies. You know, um, I remember somebody told me when you're young, you know, you're all full of piss and vinegar, and you want to go and go and go, and then it's you know, I wanted people to know who I am. I want to I want to get all the same. I want to be this. I want to win this trophy. And then as you get, you know, get in your middle age, you start helping people. And, and um, you know, you start becoming a coach and you start doing things for different reasons. But when you're getting up in my, my age, you really do want to leave a legacy of something, you know. And, and I think right now, you know, even through this pandemic and everything else, uh, I've been in more contact with friends that I wrestled with, coached and families and everything else. And I and I get these letters back and I get these texts back saying thank you so much for you know, shaping my life. And uh, and, I, I did, and for some reason that means more to me than any trophy or any, anything else that I've, uh, you know, that I've succeeded at uh, through my life. So, so I think, so I think that's how wrestling has helped me to help other people, you know, and, and uh, to help other kids that, that uh, need something to do other than sit there on their computers and you know, sit in a closed room and, and to get out and, and to meet people and and uh, learn from people and, and help people. So that's, that's what I think the biggest change uh, it's done for me. The relationships are huge. Everyone says that. It's It certainly rings true with you. I mean, you're the consummate relationship guy. Yeah. Um, well, Mr. Gallo, thank you very much for your time, sir. It's yeah. been a lot of fun to talk with you. I yeah. appreciate it. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Calm. 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 Take care, y'all. Calm.